Well, welcome everyone to what I uh, anticipate is going to be a very enjoyable hour and a half of presentation followed by a discussion um, by Shannon Brownlee. Uh, my name is Barry Kramer and I'm in the Office of Medical Applications of Research. We are the home office within the office of the director of the NIH that sponsors the NIH consensus development conferences and the NIH state of the science conferences. You have brochures at your seats and if you just look to the back of the brochure you'll see some of our upcoming conferences and you'll notice uh, a broad array of uh, very important topics to medical practice and, and public health and we they are free, open to the public. Uh, they are held at the Natural Auditorium and um, we invite you all to attend those as well. This is another uh, function of our office, the um, Mind the Gap series and it is so named because we like to have talks about gaps that exist between intuition and science or gaps between evidence and practice and we have speakers um, who have written on the, the subject and are also very, very entertaining to uh, present and to speak with you. Um, and, and hence, the second in this series, um, which is to be delivered by Shannon Brownlee. Uh, Shannon, it's a real personal pleasure for me to introduce Shannon. Um, she is an extremely accomplished person and I think you'll really have a lot of fun at this session. Uh, Shannon is a writer and essayist who is currently serving, fortunately for us, as a visiting scholar at the NIH Clinical Center in the Department of Bioethics. Uh, she is a Woodrow Wilson visiting scholar and a senior fellow at the New America Foundation in Washington, D.C. Shannon's articles and essays have appeared in many publications, including the Atlantic Monthly, the British Medical Journal, the New York Times, uh, I'm sorry, the New York Times Magazine, the New Republic, Slate, and Time. She's a recipient of the Association of Healthcare Journalists Award for Excellence, the Victor Cohn Prize for Excellence in Medical Science Reporting, the National Association of Science Writers Science and Society Award, and the Sigma Delta Chi Award from the Society of Professional Journalists, among many other awards. Her most recent work focuses on the lack of evidence in medicine and the problem of unnecessary health care, which accounts for as much as a third of the nation's health care bills. Shannon's book, Overtreated, Why Too Much Medicine is Making Us Sicker and Poorer, was named the best economics book in 2007 by the New York Times economics correspondent, David Leonard. She holds a Master of Science in Marine Science from the University of California, Santa Cruz. I just want to advertise this book. It's a wonderful book. I know at least one of you uh, in the audience has bought their copy, and I read it uh, as soon as it came out, but today's the first time I was able to get Shannon to actually write a very nice inscription on there, and I thank her for that. Um, so about today's talk. The Dartmouth Atlas Project, Atlas Project has documented a huge variation in per capita medical spending in different parts of our country, most of which simply can't be explained by variation in prevalence of illness or patient preference for even outcomes. These studies suggest that as much as a third of health care dollars are wasted on unnecessary care, the delivery of which is driven in part by lack of evidence. Comparative effectiveness research is under current discussion as one of the most important tools to improve health care while controlling runaway costs. However, we're very early in our national dialogue and in our debates about how to implement and apply comparative effectiveness research. In the meantime, what can we do? Are there interim solutions to addressing the problem of unwanted variation in medical care delivery? And Shannon is going to address those very issues. And as I say, it's a pleasure to have uh, Shannon here with us today. Shannon. Am I on? On yet? No? Yes? I may, I may have to a little bit closer. I'm not sure how to do that. Here, here we go. Um, Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Barry. Um, Barry's one of my heroes. 
I've been interviewing him for several years for various stories, um, starting with a story on PSA testing about a decade ago, more than a decade ago, which is kind of interesting to see the, the results of the New England Journal recently. Um, I spent a lot of time on that side of the podium that says National Institutes of Health, so it's really an honor and a pleasure to be standing here on this side of the podium, and thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I think I forgot, uh oh am I just using the button? Yes, oops, I forgot to put in my little disclaimer slide which says that my views do not reflect those of the NIH. Boy, do they not reflect those of the NIH in some cases. But um, uh, with that, and I don't have financial conflicts of interest. So with that, let's begin. So healthcare spending in this country is a, an enormous problem. My 13-year-old saw this slide and said, Mom, it looks like a tidal wave. And it is a tidal wave of cost. These are um, the projections from the Congressional Budget Office, which is a nonpartisan office that scores um, legislation. And what their projections are saying is that healthcare is going to be eating up an enormous percentage of GDP in the next few decades. I think uh, Peter Orzag, who's now at the OMB, has projected that by 2082, we'll have 50% uh, of GDP will be, will be healthcare. And uh, I don't think that's, I don't think you need to be an economist to know that that's not sustainable. That simply isn't sustainable. Um, so there's a perception, a widespread perception, that what is driving those costs upward is the aging of the population. But in fact, this is the CBO's projection of what part of that rise is actually due to the aging of the population. And it is really not that big a part of the problem. Um, uh, Peter Orzag has been calling it excess cost growth, which is this sort of runaway escalating cost, which is a reflection of utilization. It is not price per unit of service that is going up so much as it is um, uh, utilization. And it has real consequences for all of us. I love this cartoon. Um, it, uh, it shows that, that uh, state budgets are being busted by Medicaid right now as costs keep going up and up. And it's squeezing out other things that we could spend money on. We could spend tax money on education and roads and all kinds of other things. And instead, a great deal of that is being squeezed out by trying to pay for health care. But that's true for individuals as well. I mean, individuals are paying more and more for health care. And what's interesting is many Americans don't perceive how much they're really paying because their employer is covering their health insurance costs. They don't understand that that money is not coming out of the CEO's pocket, it's coming out of their pocket. It's coming out of their pocket in the form of lower wages and higher prices for goods and services. So we are all paying about $8,000 a year a piece if you average out that $2.4 trillion. That is enough in a family to afford to pay for a second mortgage. It's a very high cost, and it's certainly higher than our, than our European neighbors. So a really important question to ask is why are costs going up so fast? Why are our health care costs rising so quickly? And part of the answer lies in this map. Um, this is probably a map that many of you have seen, or at least a version of this. And what it is is the 306 hospital referral regions that have been defined by the Dartmouth Atlas researchers. And much of the data that I'm going to be presenting today is based on Dartmouth work. Um, then what these regions actually represent is true healthcare markets because they are lines that are drawn around Medicare recipients who live in these regions and are loyal to one or more hospitals within these regions. They're uh, a little bit bigger than the average county and they cross state lines because patients cross state lines. When they want to go to a hospital, they go to the nearest hospital, not to the hospital that may be farther away but is inside their state. So. This, this atlas has been um, very informative and very interesting. So what it has shown, what their research has shown over the last 30 years is that there is a great deal of unwarranted variation in the amount of services, medical services. Uh, one of my um, colleagues at the Department of Bioethics said, stop using the word care, it's services. <laughs> Anyway, the amount of per capita amount of services or utilization varies tremendously around the country. And there are really sort of three categories of this care in the, in the scheme, in the Dartmouth scheme of the world. Um, and uh, one of those is effective care, evidence-based care that patients who need should receive, who need it should receive. And there's variation in this. We know this from several studies. Elizabeth McGlynn's study from RAND is one of the most famous that found that, that patients were on average um, 50, had, had a 50% likelihood of getting needed effective care like 
uh, aspirin and beta blockers on discharge from the hospital after an acute MI. Another category of care is preference sensitive care. And this um, is probably a new idea to a lot of people. But this is elective procedures and tests whose use or, or delivery should depend on the patient's choice, but all too often actually depends on the physician's preference, the physician's opinion. And then the third category of care is um, what they call supply sensitive care which means that the, the amount of services that are delivered of this kind of category depend on the supply of resources. So more hospital beds in, a, in an area, you get more hospitalizations. More ICU beds, you get more ICU days. More CT scanners, you get more CT scans. Um, and these are discretionary in general. When, when the hospitalization is not discretionary, we don't see variation. For hip fracture, we don't see variation across regions. When a patient comes in with a hip fracture, everybody knows, put them in the hospital. So, um, so what's, what's really quite extraordinary is how much of Medicare spending goes towards these three different kinds of care. And effective care is really a small portion of it. Now, that doesn't mean that all of that supply-sensitive care was useless. It just means that that it was this kind of discretionary care that varies all over the place depending on where you live. And preference sensitive care is mostly elective surgeries and tests, and that accounts for about a quarter of, of Medicare spending. So first I'm going to talk about this idea of preference sensitive care. It usually involves a trade-off, that there is usually more than one treatment for a given condition. Um, no treatment is often an option, or maybe not an option in the, in the mind of the physician, but, but maybe an option in the mind of the patient. Uh, I don't know how many of you attended the wonderful lecture by Atul Gawande, who, who talked about a patient who um, had been diagnosed with um, uh, aortic aneurysm and who came in with acute chest pain, and it looked like her aneurysm was dissecting. and um, she was given the option of having surgery. She was about 80 years old and still living on her own. And she was told what the risk of um, stroke was and what the risk of uh, having to be in the nursing home for several months after the surgery was. And she decided not to get the surgery. Now, and Atul Gawande said it was the first time he had ever sent a patient out of the hospital thinking he was sending a patient home to die. Um, so, so preference sensitive decisions should be based on what the patient wants, what the patient values. So a perfect example is mastectomy versus lumpectomy. The decision should be depend on what the patient values. And different women are going to value different things. So women who to value not having to worry about getting screened repeatedly, not having to worry about a recurrence, would might choose mastectomy. Women who value their breasts might choose lumpectomy. Um, and finally, the problem with preference-sensitive care, it's often provider opinion that determines which treatment is chosen. So, um, uh, and this was a story that appeared in the New York Times that talked about the fact that there's this enormous variation. And so, you know, where you live is what you get was the bottom line. And so we know that provider opinion varies from place to place and that it often determines what the rate of, of delivery of that service is by just going on the ground and going to places. So if you go to Elyria, Ohio, you will find the reason that patients in Elyria, Ohio are three times more likely to get PCI than patients in Cleveland, Ohio, which is 30 miles away, which is kind of ironic since Cleveland is the home to the Cleveland Clinic famous heart, heart hospital. Um, and the reason that patients are more likely to get PCI in Elyria is because of one practice of cardiologists who are very, very aggressive, who believe it, that they should do PCI early and often. Um, in Lubbock, Texas, it's the same thing. It's a few cardiology practices that are very, very aggressive. If you um, go to Bend, Oregon, and Boise, Idaho, well, in the case of Boise, the reason that back surgery rates are four times greater than they are in, say, Bangor, Maine, the reason is is because of two practices, orthopedic practices, that are particularly aggressive. Um, now, it's tempting to think that these physicians are operating outside of clinical norms, that they are, they are somehow operating on inappropriate patients. And certainly that happens in this country, that, that there, is, there are surgeries that are done, there are tests that are given to patients who don't fall within the appropriateness guidelines. 
But for the most part, that's not really what's going on. For the most part, most patients, even when you look, there, there was a very interesting study that looked at, at, um, uh, at cabbage patients. And their records were given to a panel of experts to decide whether or not they were given cabbage appropriately. And it was really a pretty small percentage who fell outside of the appropriateness guidelines. Now, a lot of them fell in the gray zone. So about 35% were in this sort of, mm, maybe they, sh they could have gotten it, maybe they shouldn't have gotten it. About 15% uh, fell in that these patients should not have gotten the surgery. So for the most part, it's not that we have renegade physicians who are, who are you know, rubbing their hands together every time a patient comes in the door, another patient, another sale on my boat. It's, it's, they are operating within the clinical guidelines. So um, this is just gives you a sense of the extraordinary range of the rates of surgery in different parts of the country. Um, and this is looking at knee replacement. And by the way, all of this is Medicare. This is all Medicare population because that's where the data are. And the reason that it's only Medicare is because it's very, very hard to get um, consistent data from private payers. So these are based on Medicare claims data. But there's no reason to think that what happens to Medicare patients is fundamentally different from what's happening to patients who are privately insured or self-insured. So this looks at um, the rate of knee replacement uh, in different parts of the country in these different hospital referral regions compared to the national average. So you can see that there's this, do we have a little pointer by any chance? No. Oh, here. Great. So you can see, I'm going to do it over here, am I? You can see it, that there's this very high rate of knee replacement in these areas and very low rate of knee, knee replacement in certain other areas. Com in fact, it's below the national average in, I'm not even sure what state that is. Anybody take a guess? Uh, knee replacement is remarkably low in downstate New York. Knee replacement is low in Southern California. And knee replacement is low in my home state of Hawaii. Either that or Hawaii is not populated enough. It may not have enough knee surgeries. So there's this enormous range of, um, of, of knee replacement. And this just gives you another way of looking at the knee replacement. Each of those dots represents the uh, each one of those hospital referral regions, those 306 regions. And you can see that it goes from a low of a little over three per 1,000 Medicare enrollees to a high of almost 15 Medicare enrollees. And there's Lubbock, Texas right up there. And there's Manhattan way at the bottom. I think what Manhattan's not even on the uh, on this on this uh, turnip graph. Now, what's interesting? Another thing that's interesting about this is that these surgical rates don't change over time. So, what this is looking at is the rate of knee replacement in 1992, 1993 versus the rate of knee replacement in 2000, 2001, and it hasn't really changed very much. And if you look at any individual surgery, what we'll see is that there's no apparent rhyme or reason for why knee replacement is high, say, in Santa Barbara, or knee replacement is actually very low in Santa Barbara, and then cabbage is very high, and then hysterectomy is very low or in the middle. So every region of the country has this extremely variable rate of surgery that, depending on which surgery you're looking at, and those rates tend to be very stable over time. Now, these, this variation has enormous implications for patients, and obviously it has um, profound implications for payers. So these conditions, these are just a few of the conditions that show this kind of variability. And the top, the, the top 10 variable conditions, if you take the sort of conditions that vary the most, um, they account for 40% of what Medicare spends on elective surgery. So, so those, those top 10 account for 40% of the Medicare spending on elective surgeries. What, now, what's interesting is that in some cases, we have pretty good evidence for the efficacy of, these, of various choices. We have really good evidence for um, that, that knee, knee, you know, knee surgery, knee replacement, and hip replacement really can relieve pain. And we have very good evidence for what sort of the risk is of the surgery. So uh, we have very good evidence for mastectomy versus lumpectomy, that they're really pretty much equivalent in terms of outcomes. 
But in other cases, we don't have the evidence. We don't know which choice offers which degree of benefit. So if you look at early prostate cancer, is surgical intervention better? Is radiation better? Is watchful waiting better? We don't really know. And when we look just at radiation, there are five different modalities of radiation. Which one is superior? We have no idea. So in some of these cases, there's very good evidence for the efficacy or the effectiveness of the intervention. And in other cases, there really isn't very good evidence. But there's another source of uncertainty, another gap in our knowledge. And that is the question of what patients want. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that patients are actually, uh, that physicians are not very accurate in diagnosing what their patients really want. So one piece of evidence is, um, this was a recent paper in um, medical care. I'm not sure if that's a, a Canadian journal, but this is a Canadian study led by Jillian Hawker. And what they did was they conducted a survey, a telephone survey, where they asked people about their, um, whether or not they were appropriate patients for arthroplasty, for knee pain. And, um, and they actually then looked at patient records and films and, and figured out how many people were actually appropriate patients. And then of those appropriate patients, they then went back and said, who was willing to undergo knee surgery, knee replacement? No, not knee replacement, knee surgery. Um, anybody want to take a guess what percentage? Oh, by the way, if you have questions, ask me, interrupt me. Just, just raise your hand. I'm happy to stop and, and go from there. But does anybody have any thought about what percentage of appropriate patients were actually willing to undergo the surgery? 30%. Half that. 15%. It, which is really, I think, kind of, kind of surprising. You'd think that it would be higher. This is pain we're talking about, and this is, some, you know, if they 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 want relief from their pain, but only 15 percent, when when they really started to understand what the trade-offs were, wanted wanted to have the surgery. Um, and this is another study, and and there there are lots of studies, so I'm just kind of giving you the the quick overview. But this is more direct evidence that the role that physician opinion plays or practice style plays in determining rates of surgery. Um, and these are clinical trials that look at the impact of something called patient decision aids. And these are, um, these are video discs, these are brochures, interactive web-based programs, anything to try to help a patient understand, truly understand what the risks are, what the benefits are, on depending on what their decision is. And it turns out it's, it's really hard to help patients. It, it's not easy to get patients to truly understand this stuff. Most Americans don't really understand statistics very well. They don't understand risk very well. So how you put something can have enormous impact on how they perceive risk. This is something the drug industry has gotten very good at. And so, of course, all of their uh, drug ads talk about relative risk. They don't talk about absolute risk for the most part. So, um, so, so if you randomize patients into usual care, which is usually the physician, often the surgeon, saying, well, these are what the risks are, these are what the benefits are, and, and going through it with the patient. If you randomize patients to usual care versus getting a patient decision aid, and then actually looking at the quality of their decision, did they make a decision that was really in, in line with their own values? Um, it turns out that the control group is a lot more likely to choose the, whatever the intervention is than the, than, the, than the group that got the patient decision aids. Now, depending on what the intervention is, whether it's a PSA test or, or cabbage, patients are anywhere from 7 to 60% less likely to choose an intervention when they actually have access to a decision aid, when they truly start to become informed. And I see this as incredibly important for patients. Um, they, patients have a really hard time uh, disp making their doctors unhappy. I mean, I find this. I'm one of the more informed patients around. And I find it, I, in fact, I've stopped going to my doctor because I don't want to have the fights that we've had for the last 10 years about screening. And I, and I don't want to displease her. And I feel that when I say no, I really don't see the, the evidence 
to say that I ought to go get this particular screening test and so I don't want to do it. I, there's a sense that it, it's upsetting to her because in a way what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm criticizing her knowledge and all she has is knowledge. So I'm criticizing her ability to judge what's best for me. I'm criticizing, uh, implicitly criticizing her, her, how much she cares about me. And I know she does care about me. So even for me, it's very, very difficult to go against what my physician wants me to do. And I think a lot of patients find this. So if we, it, so the idea that, it, you know, if you just sort of discuss it with your patient, especially if you're the surgeon and you believe in what you do, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be cutting people open if you didn't believe in what you did. Um, if you're the surgeon, you may not be the appropriate person to be, to be trying to give impartial, balanced information to your patient. Is that a function of doctors not knowing how to talk to patients or it's a cultural thing in that, you know, patients want to more conservatively see, maybe they'll get better, maybe I can pray it away time? I think it's a lot of things. I think physicians, I mean, were any of the physicians in this room actually trained how to talk to patients in a way that could really convey to them risks and benefit in multiple ways. Because it often takes multiple tries at getting a person to understand how, how the trade-offs really work. I would say that I regard myself as a very compassionate physician, and I know I can sell the patient on anything. Yes. You gave the example of treatment for prostate cancer, five kinds of radiation, treatment for radiation oncologist. I think they have a pretty good idea that they are pretty much the same, but the ones that get used the most are the ones that reimburse the most. There's no secret about it. Uh, I, I try never to be the one who brings that topic up first, but it is an issue. It is absolutely an issue. We have a reimbursement structure that actually drives the system towards A, more utilization, and B, uh, higher, more, more, better reimbursement. Things that reimburse better get, get utilized more. And we also have a, a system that, that uh, often goes against what the evidence says. So if something is highly reimbursed but all the evidence says you shouldn't be doing it, it's going to continue to be done in many cases until the evidence is so overwhelming and, and the society, the, the particular physician group has finally said, no, we ought to stop doing this. So uh, that's a real problem. Yes? Isn't the ability of uh, patients to understand choices that are being Health literacy, that's exactly right. Health literacy is an enormous barrier. So if you want to give a patient a decision aid that will really and truly help them understand, you have to give it to them in, mul it ha they have to receive the information in multiple ways. So for example, I, I forgot to bring a couple of decision aids that one particular company produces. But they present things visually. They do things in writing. They have a video where they actually have real patients talking about the choices they made. They present it in multiple ways. And it really takes a while. It takes about a half an hour to go through the PSA decision aid to, to, to really make sure that the patient understands what the therapeutic steps are going to be if they make a decision A versus what the steps are going to be if they make decision B. And then what the trade-offs are on either side. Yes, there was a patient, there was a question. Hello, hello, okay. Um, how do you assess if a patient truly understands the information that is given to them? That is a very good question. So um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock uh, is one of several hospitals that have actually put into place a formalized process for patients to go through before they go through surgery. Um, and Dartmouth's is probably the most well-developed. It's, it's the oldest, and so it's a really quite well-developed system. And um, I'll tell you a story about a particular patient to illustrate this. Um, Dr. Dale Collins is a breast reconstructive surgeon at Dartmouth, and she tells this story about a patient who came to her who had gone through the decision aid process and who had chosen mastectomy. Now, the, the, the strongest predictor of which one you're going to choose as a woman with early breast cancer is whether you value your breasts more or you value peace of mind more. And so this patient had chosen mastectomy, yet on her response sheet, she had indicated that she valued her breasts tremendously. 
And so Dale looked at this thing, and there were actually a couple of indicators in the patient questionnaire that suggested that this patient was making a choice that was not actually consonant with her values. And she was saying she, under, she understood the risks and benefits, but her value, she hadn't really understood how her values were supposed to come into play. And so Dale said, I'd like you to do, I think she asked her to do the, the decision aid again, and the woman came back and said, I've changed my mind, I want a lumpectomy. So there are ways to get at the quality of the decision that the patient has made. Um, and this is an area that is absolutely ripe for research, to try to find out how best to convey information to patients and then test whether or not they really A, understood the information, and B, are making decisions that, um, that are in keeping with their own values. So we have this bottom line where patients are making decisions that are, that are cl we're clearly having patient de patients make decisions without, in the absence of patient decision aids and real shared decision making, we are, we are, it's a pretty good bet that we have patients who are making the wrong decision. Uh, and who in fact probably would choose less invasive interventions if they had access to a way of really understanding what the trade-offs are. And this is, this is an interesting um, clinical trial that Jack Wenberg um, was part of that was conducted in the, in the early 1990s. And um, they designed a, a decision aid for men who had benign prostate hyperplasia. And it, it basically, the two choices were watchful waiting or transurethral, I'm gonna screw this up, Barry, help me, TERP, transurethral, Restriction of the prostate, right. So those were the two choices, and they created this decision aid. And then what they did is they went to two um, organized group practices. One of them was in um, Seattle, Washington. It was Group Health of Puget Sound. And the other one was Kaiser Permanente in, Ki in Denver. And uh, so the patients in group at Group Health didn't get the decision aid, and the patients at Kaiser did get the decision aid. And what they found was that the population-based rate for prostatectomy fell 40% in Denver after introduction of the patient decision aid. Um, and, and the rates, it, it, and I don't know what the, I wonder what the, the control was. They must have had some formalized way of having the physician, the physician actually explain what the trade-offs were. And so it didn't change in, um, in Seattle. And so when they then compared the benchmark um, to the rates among the 306 hospital referral regions, they found that um, the shared decision-making benchmark was at the very low end compared to the rest of the country. So what we see is, is um, over here, this one. This is the decision aid in Seattle. This is what the rate was in Seattle. So the rate in Seattle was already pretty low, and this is what the rate was in, um, in Kaiser, and it fell 40%. Okay. Yes? Why, why is it if the more information the patient has, the less treatment the patient on average decides to take? Why don't insurance companies require some sort of patient decision made? For example, in the Quaker meeting, the Quaker meeting will not allow you to be married in the Quaker meeting unless you have mandatory counseling before you get married. Interesting. Well, there are some <laughs> insurers who are offering it, but they are not requiring it. And the reason is, is insurance companies are terrified that anybody is going to think that they want to restrict somebody's God-given right to get a prostatectomy. Um, they, they're very worried about the perception that they are trying to deny care just to save money, number one. Number two, I'm, a lot of insurance companies these days actually are, all they are is, um, is claims adjusters and risk adjusters. They're not actually taking risk because they're doing this service for self-insured companies. And so in the end, they don't have that big an incentive to bring down costs. But insurance companies would be one way to get this into patients' hands. The problem is, is that if you just offer it to patients without having buy-in from the physicians, it probably doesn't work as well. So what we really want is for there to be real buy-in from physicians, and primary care physicians are probably the most, the most likely candidates because they don't really have a dog in the fight when it comes to surgery. So 
that's where that decision probably should be happening is in the in the in the primary care office or it could happen in in the hospital setting provided you have a hospital that's really devoted to making sure that your patients that their patients are um, making the right decision and getting surgery that they not only are appropriate for but that they want oh now let's see uh, this is the same surgery for patients a decade later. And as you can see, it's still varying all over the map. If anything, it's gone up. So what we see is enormous variation in all of these, um, in all of these interventions that I listed at the, the, at the very beginning, the five, inter five or six interventions that I listed at the, at the beginning. Now Lubbock, Texas, I think is not even on, no, Lubbock here, is Lubbock here? Oh, that's interesting. Now, it used to be that Lubbock was really high. I think they, there, a, a New York Times story came out saying that they were, they were giving an extraordinary number of, of procedures to patients, so maybe they, uh, they notched it down. Are they at the top? Oh, yes, you're right. They are the top. They have not notched it down. At any rate, this is, um, this is a pretty large variation and, and something that there's pretty good evidence for what the appropriate candidates are. Um, once again, you see this in cabbage, and, and this is just looking at the, the sort of hot spots. Baltimore, Maryland is one of the hot spots. Oops, same place, sorry. Uh, back surgery varies all over the place. Casper, Wyoming is, is a hot spot. There's Lubbock right in there. <laughs> But what's interesting is that, that, that different places have high rates for different things. It's not as if surgery is generally done more often in Lubbock, Texas, or in, in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. It's that different surgeries are done at different rates in different places. So what this suggests is that um, clinical appropriateness needs to be based on something other than what we're doing now. Um, it needs to be based on outcomes research. Certainly, that kind of evidence is needed. There's a real gap there. But there's also a gap in knowing what patients really want. And we need to, ch I, I think, I agree with the, the, the Wenberg group that we need to start changing the, um, the definition from informed consent to informed patient choice. And, you know, it's really interesting because um, I, I've thought for a while that we need to rethink this idea of consent. As an, as an outsider looking, oh yes, go ahead. So it's patient demand, yeah. I, that's probably part of it. That's certainly part of it. I mean, patient demand is always in there. The, the question is, would it vary that much? And why would we see why would we see this low well why, i guess i guess patient demand is still consistent with using patient patient decision aids and seeing it drop certainly it could be part of it and we know patient demand is a part of a lot of what's going on in in american health care patients come in and want a ct scan they want an mri because the person down the street got one for their knee and clearly it must have been a good thing and we have this general perception that more is better and we have this general perception that more technological is even better than just plain more. Um, but the idea of consent is, is really interesting. Yes, go ahead. So you keep showing all this variation, but you show a variation based on, um, on procedures. Is there a similar variation for drugs, or is that more? Uh, I uh, don't have the data for that. Okay. I don't know, I'm, I'm sure they're available but I don't have the data for that. And, and you would think that there are probably regional variations in how physicians um, prescribe based on sort of practice patterns that develop regionally. Um, the, the, this idea of consent is, I mean, what it implies is that you're giving permission for somebody to do something to you that you might not have wanted otherwise. And, so, so we can, and the, the word consent has this sort of rich meaning. We can consent to 
waiving rights. We can consent to court, in, in court we can consent to things. There's an age of consent for sexual activity. Um, so it's, it's that you are agreeing to something. And, and it means permit, it means to allow. And the phrase informed consent conveys something very, very different from the phrase informed choice. And so we may need to start really rethinking how we, how we ask patients to say yes to doing things and really changing the standard. Because choice employs a, implies a much more active decision than consent does. Um, and in, in some ways, not being an op give, given an opportunity to make an informed choice, but instead giving informed consent, um, can have really negative impact on patients. And I just want to tell you a story that a, that a physician told me, oh gosh, about a year ago. He's a hospitalist. His name is Peter Kibbe, and he's a hospitalist in, a, uh, in the South. And he told me about this, this man that he cared for who had been hospitalized for an exacerbation of his congestive heart failure. And, and this guy was very elderly, very frail, and everything was falling apart. He had diabetes, he had kidney failure, he had congestive heart failure, he had pulmonary whatever. He, he was in very, very bad shape. So Peter was examining him and um, suddenly the man sits up and clutches his chest and starts to scream in pain. And then he says to Peter, stop doing that to me. And what was going on was that his ICD was going off. And he was so demented that he didn't remember that he had had the surgery s several weeks or months, I'm not sure how long, but he could not remember that, that he had this device inside his chest and that that's what was shocking him. And he thought Peter was shocking him. So he did not leave the hospital. He died a few days later, maybe, maybe a week later, and his ICD went off several more times during that period. And you have to wonder what his family really understood about what this device was likely to do for a guy who had a very short life expectancy. And it's easy to imagine that they thought, this is very expensive, therefore it's very valuable. It's going to offer real value. It's really going to extend his life. Because in the rest of our economy, price and value are very much related. So if you pay $400 to stay in the Four Seasons Hotel, you are going to have a much nicer stay than if you stay for $40 at Motel 6. You're going to get a much nicer meal for $100 in general than for $5 at McDonald's. So we tend to think that cost is the same as value. But they also probably thought, as many Americans do, that technology equals value. And you have to wonder what they would have decided if they had truly understood how little value this device really was offering their grandfather, their brother, their, their father, their, their uncle. And you have to wonder what choice they would have made if they'd really understood that there was a high likelihood that he was going to be shocked and that it was going to hurt and that his death was going to be made worse in many ways by having this device in his chest. So, I think that we, that, that we have to start thinking about the idea that, that operating on the wrong patient may be a form of medical error. If operating on the wrong knee is a medical error, what about operating on a woman who really wanted a lumpectomy and got a mastectomy instead? So that is my section on, on this, that kind of variation, the, the, this preference-sensitive variation. And so now I want to turn to the other kind of variation, which many of you have probably heard of, which is this sort of supply-driven variation. Supply push is the way they put it in, in the high-tech industry. Um, so another Dartmouth Atlas, which is probably the more familiar one, and what this is is how much Medicare spends per beneficiary in different parts of the country. Once again, these are the 306 hospital referral regions, and this is a two and a half fold variation. Going from, oops, the blue is a little mistake, but um, it, it goes from a low $5,280 per recipient per year. In all of these northern states, which is kind of interesting, in Idaho uh, and uh, Salt Lake, to a high of $14,000 per recipient per year. Two and a half fold variation. Um, this is 
really mostly driven. This dollar figure is driven by utilization and it is driven mostly by supply sensitive care. So this is care that is discretionary. It's discretionary hospitalizations. It's discretionary placement of the patient in an ICU. It's discretionary CT, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it is governed by assumptions that if the resources are available, you can use them, you should use them, that the number of resources, the number of beds per capita has been somehow set by the market and by the need of the population. Um, it's, it, it, what's, what's interesting for this talk is that a lot of it happens because we don't have evidence. We don't know when you really need to hospitalize a pneumonia patient or whether hospitalizing them is better than taking care of them in the nursing home or taking care of them at home. We don't know necessarily whether or not the patient really needs a CT scan or not. or whether We don't even know whether or not it's actually improving our ability to diagnose for the most part if you give a patient a CT scan. Now, in some cases we do know, but in other cases we don't. So, um, so when there is an evidence and when there is a lot of supply and, the, and we assume that more care and more intensive care is better, supply tends to drive what happens to patients. So this just shows you a little bit of the, um, the variation. Now, this is a different population. This is not just the general Medicare population. These are days in the hospital for patients who have um, chronic, chronic illnesses, and it is the last six months of life. Now, the reason to look at patients who are uh, near the end of life who are chronically ill is A, they're all really very sick, and B, everybody's dead at the end. So it's, it's a way of starting to try to look at a cohort of patients who are, um, apple, you're trying to compare apples to apples. So once again, we see this enormous variation. And when I say 77 best hospitals, what that means is the US News and World Report's um, best hospitals issue. So these are mostly academic medical centers. And there's a fourfold variation in how much Medicare spends on um, Medicare recipients in these hospitals, in these best hospitals, which caused the economist Uwe Reinhardt to say once, uh, how can the best care in the world cost four times more than the best care in the world? So, um, and, and what's interesting about using this cohort of patients is you might say, well, uh, maybe some of them died faster. So the hospitals that were at the low end of utilization had patients who died very, very quickly and therefore did not utilize a lot of care. And the, patient, and the hospitals at the top that had, um, let's see who those hospitals really are, the hospitals at the top who had very high utilization, had patients who lingered over the period of time and really needed lots and lots of care. And there, there, are, pa there are variations in how long patients um, take to die and how much care they need and how sick they are. But if you look at what happens to those patients in those hospitals in the six months prior to death, and then you look at the, the amount of care that they, need, they utilized in the previous six months, and then you look at the previous six months and the previous six months, hospitals that tended to give patients a lot of care in the, first, in the six months closest to death were also giving them a lot of care or a lot of services in the previous six months, the previous six months, the previous six months. It suggests that it's not something that's, 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 that's in the nature of the patient, it's in the nature of the care, the, the nature of the services that are being delivered by the hospital. So, um, and, and the highest hospital on here isn't even on here, which is, is Hahnemann Hospital, I believe, in Philadelphia. So, yes? I don't think you're asking the right question. The, uh, I'm an attorney who specializes in representing a doctor. Many of my clients have been past. Many of my clients have been uh, uh, hospital administrators, including one of them was the CEO of Mayo Rochester for seven years. And th their our view is that the supply drives the the utilization, and that the doctors are forced to doctors are forced to to, uh, in order to keep up their production quotas, are forced to utilize it. And so, what, it, it, to use a simple analogy, some areas have a 60-pound frog in their bathtub to feed, and some areas have a 5-pound frog. And the ones with, this, with the 60-pound frog have to, f have to feed more patients to that frog because they have 
more hospital capacity, more medical machines, more people that have to be have to be supported. And the patients are the ones that lose because they get overtreated. You just made my whole point so I can, I can doctors, pack up and go home. <laughs> doctors and nurses who complain about this get kicked out of their ass and the organization I represent, the Samoai Society, we have a very high suicide rate. We have people on suicide watch all the time because they try to stand up to this and they lose. Well, this that's a separate issue that I'm not going to address, but the, the analogy of the frog is a really good one because, in fact, it and, and it's not happening often at a conscious level. In some places, it certainly there's you know demands for for keeping up your production, but some of it also happens at an unconscious level. So one of the one of the neat little studies that Jack Wenberg did was he looked at um, physicians who moved between Yale, New Haven, and Boston because Boston had a very high rate of beds and a very high rate of hospitalization. And at this time, this was in the 1980s, Yale, in the 80s and 90s, Yale had a very low rate of beds compared to, to Boston and pretty low rates of hospitalization for the same population of patients, Medicare recipients. And so what he did is he asked doctors who had gone from Boston to Yale and from Yale to, to Boston, do you see a difference in how many patients you can put in your ICU? They said no. They did not perceive that there was either pressure on them or that they were behaving any differently, that they were treating their patients any differently. So it's, it's a number of forces, but the, the analogy of the frog that you have to feed is a very good one. The bigger the capacity, the larger the capacity of the supply of resources, the more utilization you see. So, um, and this just kind of drives that home. This is looking at the last two years of life and looking at days of hospitals days in the hospital and inpatient visits in these various places. So you can, there's this enormous range, and these are all chronically ill patients in the last two years of life. And so the question is, what is driving it? And certainly, uh, certainly demanding hospital administrators may be a piece of it. Patient demand is a piece of it. Um, It's very interesting. Uh, nobody said malpractice, which, which is the, the response that I almost always get from, from physician groups and from, from uh, the general public, that, it, that it's got to be defensive medicine. And certainly defensive medicine is a piece of what's going on. But it looks like defensive medicine is sort of a baseline across the country, that there, we don't really know how much of it there is. But on top of that baseline, there's this huge variation in how much utilization there is. So what's driving utilization is, um, is certainly defensive medicine. It's certainly patient demand. It's certainly also this, what, what's called, being called the technology arms race, which is every hospital in the country wants a cyber knife, a robot, a 64 slice scanner, because this is what draws in paying patients. And it also draws in your brain maker physicians. It draws in your interventional cardiologist when you have a 64 slice scanner. So hospitals are now spending money on all these technologies. And the technology, once it's bought, it's going to get used. Once the hospital's made that capital investment, it's going to get used. So what this is looking at is, um, is cost per capita, what Medicare is spending, which is a good, uh, which is a good proxy of of utilization, but then it's also showing utilization in these areas where there's very high utilization versus very low utilization, and it just shows that there's this enormous range. And there's a range in the resources available, so full-time equivalent physicians per, um, per capita is what this is, per thousand Medicare recipients. So what we're looking at is that in, in the low areas, you've got all physicians, you've got 16.6 full-time equivalents. And obviously, you have to use some way of figuring out full-time equivalents because your average academic medical center, for example, physicians are not seeing patients full-time, versus 29 for the same population of patients, these patients in the last two years of life. So the supply has an enormous amount to do with it. And the question is, why would supply have this effect? have this effect. And a piece of it is this gap in evidence, this lack of evidence.
And I think this is one of the most interesting findings. This is from a cohort study that Elliot Fisher conducted um, that was published in 2003 in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And what he looked at was 300,000 patients with acute MI, 300,000 patients with hip fracture, and 300,000 patients with colon resection for colon cancer. And he looked at what happened to those patients from the index hospitalization. And he chose those particular indications because everybody knows what you have to do. Your, your acute MI patient is hospitalized, your hip fracture patient is hospitalized, your colon resection has to happen in the hospital. And then he looked at what happened to those patients, what their services, what, what utilization was for those cohorts of patients in different regions of the country that had a previous tendency to deliver large volumes of care versus lower volumes. And what he found was that um, the major stuff, like cabbage, like hip, hip surgery, um, didn't vary that much. And with the vertical line, this is the relative risk of getting one of these procedures or surgeries, depending on whether you're in one of these low utilizing regions, which is the vertical axis, versus a high spending, high utilizing region. And the one that, that I think is so interesting is that you're three and a half times more likely to get a vena cava filter if you are in Los Angeles for your heart attack over the course of a year than you are if you have your heart attack in Portland, Oregon. So that's what this says, is you're three times more likely to get a, a scope down your throat if you are hospitalized for hip fracture in Manhattan versus Salt Lake City. Yes? That is such an important question. There is variation. I mean, even in uh, socialized medicine countries where, where there's a single payer and even a single provider like the UK where the physicians are employed by, by the government. Um, there is variation, but nobody's really done a Dartmouth Atlas for Canada or the UK or Denmark or Sweden or any other place. And it would be really interesting. Yes. I wonder how much it go if you look at medical schools. If you've looked at medical schools and see how the medical education varies between Boston and uh, Oregon, for example. It, it's the shadow curriculum that's important here. It's not what they're learning in class. It's what they learn on their rotations and in residency. So if you are in medical school, if you're doing your residency at one of these high utilizing places like NYU, the shadow curriculum is telling you lots of testing. Call in, call in uh, uh, proceduralists at every opportunity. Put the patient in intensive care. It, 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 it's, it, it is cultural. It's practice patterns that build up. So an interesting little tidbit of, that, that illustrates this is, is the, well, how many questions are on the boards for internal medicine? I think it's 400 questions for your board test for internal medicine. 30 of those questions, the right answer is do nothing. And, pay, and physicians who train in these high utilizing areas, in hospitals in these very high utilizing areas, where care is really quite fragmented and chaotic, tend to get all, many, most or all of those questions wrong. So the shadow curriculum is teaching them, is not teaching them when to uh, stand back and do nothing. It's teaching them to do something. So the next question, anyone has tried to intervene there? Well, Dartmouth's been trying to get this idea across for 30 years, and it's, it's, I mean, it's hard to accept. People don't want to think that they're throwing unnecessary care at people. And hospital administrators are so busy sort of scrambling to make their margins that they don't want to think about the fact that, they, that, that the process of feeding the frog is is giving patients stuff not only they don't need, but might harm them. Yes. 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 Risk adjusted in all kinds of ways. So, um, so the real question is, is higher utilization buying better care? Is it buying better outcomes? 
And the answer is it's not buying better quality. This is the relationship between how much Medicare spends per capita in every state, the, the 50 dots or the 50 states, and the technical quality of the care in that state. And if anything, there's an inverse relationship. So spending more does not give you better technical quality of care. And this is based on several studies, probably a dozen different studies. And um, what it shows is that you're not getting better technical quality of care for more spending and more utilization. You are getting more hospital stays, more, more services, but you're not getting more elective surgery. That's what's so interesting. So downstate New York is one of the very highest utilizing areas, but many elective surgeries are actually quite low there. Um, you get worse communication among physicians, and this is really important, I think. Um, as reported by physicians, in these areas that are very high utilizing, you get worse communication among physicians. You get worse continuity of care, and the patients are less satisfied with their care. They have lower quality of life or no better. They have worse access to primary care, and they have higher mortality. So that cohort study that I talked about where it was the, the AMI, uh, hip fracture, and colon resection, when you looked at what happened to those patients over the course of the year from that index hospitalization, this risk-adjusted group of patients, they had two to hot to six percent higher mortality in places where they received more services. And this actually makes sense because if the care is not contributing to health, it's still offering risk. It's still posing risk. And patients forget that and physicians forget it as well, I think. So that's kind of a not so good bottom line. And I think it's really shocking to patients to think about this because they assume, many of the things that I've just said, because they assume that the care that's being delivered is based on what they need, not on the need of the hospital to make money, not on some unconscious decision by the physician to hospitalize because it's available, or to call in a pulmonologist because you're coughing. It, it, they want to believe that the care that they're getting is based not only on evidence, but it's on what they need. And that doesn't seem to be what's going on. So um, to sum up, we're using a lot of money. The, the bottom line here is that um, that we are using about a third of our money, that 2.4 trillion is going towards unnecessary care. And, <laughs> and, and so much of it is driven by uncertainty and the anxiety, I think, that uncertainty engenders for physicians. Throw tests at a patient when you don't know what's going on. Yet, it's got coming at a very high price for patients and it's coming at a very high price for the nation. So I think the final, the final thing that I'll leave you with is that um, while I think our efforts towards comparative effectiveness research are absolutely essential, clinical evidence is not really going to be enough to really bend our cost curve down anytime soon. In part because the kind of evidence that we're going after is pretty focused. It's, you know, is, is, uh, is Genentech's drug for, for uh, macular degeneration, is its old drug just as good as its new drug? This is very, very focused. And some of the clinical evidence that we really need is what is the right supply of resources? How, is it, how do you best take care of a congestive heart failure patient? Now, one of the things that we know from this map that's very interesting is that these light areas that are the lowest utilizing areas are dominated by organized group practices. They also have greater access to primary care. So we know also that these areas that are the highest utilizing have more fragmented care. They also tend to have more insurance companies, which tends to fragment care even more. So these places are doing it better for cheaper. And we ought to think hard about that when we think about policy. But the bottom line for, for the use of evidence is that um, we need to reduce the overuse of acute care hospitals, and organized care is doing a better job at that. And so in a way, that ought to be our goal, that we have much more organized care all across the country.
Um, and ensuring patient, informed patient choice is the other piece that we have to start thinking about. And that requires a real change in thinking in how we, in how we, um, we talk to patients about what they need and what they want. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. I would just want to know, for the next step after this, after the research has been done, who would you, where would the, the targets be to try to make a change in the utilization of services and the increase in costs of, of these things that you just talked about? Um, I think getting a primary care infrastructure is a piece of it. Uh, it's really clear that prime areas that have robust primary care, organized primary care, have lower utilization rates, they have lower hospitalization rates, they have just better care. So introducing a robust, organized primary care infrastructure is important. And we've talked about the medical home now, and the problem with the medical home, as I see it, is that, that a lot of it is going to just turn out to pay doctors more without asking them to change the way they practice. Number two, um, we need to reduce the overuse of acute care hospitals. And the, the terrible tragedy here is that when hospitals do start to reduce overutilization, they get punished financially. So I was just in Roanoke, Virginia, um, visiting a hospital chain called the Carillion Clinic that's in the process of trying to become an organized group practice. And um, they have actually reduced uh, what was it? What did they do that was interesting? Well, it cost them money. They, re they basically were able to organize one tiny section of how you take care of, of um, uh, patients with chest pain and reduce utilization of the hospital, reduce hospitalization. You don't want to be in the hospital. That's where you get MRSA and, and errors. And it's costing them about a million dollars a year. And that million dollars is going to the payer. So the payers are getting a windfall, and the hospital is delivering better care, and it's losing money. So we need to find ways to start taking the money that payers save and returning it to the hospital so that they can then reinvestment in, in changing the way they practice. Yes? So this is a research institute, and we just got $10 billion to spend on research in the next two years. If you were the director of the NIH, where would you put that money for research to accomplish what you're saying? I would put some of it certainly into the kind of comparative effectiveness that we're talking about, which is sort of specifics of clinical practice. I would put some of it into um, researching shared decision making and, and creating patient decision aids and getting those into practice. And I would put some of it into, um, into looking, in, into sort of pinning down some of these things and really being able to push the, the supply sensitive care issue. But the, the NIH, it, I don't think that's really likely because of the culture of the NIH. And so in some ways, better to spend, have someone else spend that money on health services research and have the NIH spend the money on, on, on the sort of clinically focused research that it's actually very, very good at. It doesn't do enough of it, but it's very good at it. Well, the other agency that's a possibility would be the, um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, ARC. And they certainly fund a certain amount of health services research. But you know, we, can, we could actually change Medicare policy now and have an impact on this stuff. We don't have to wait for a lot more research. We have a great deal of data in the Dartmouth Atlas. And it's not perfect data, but it's really good. It's really robust data. And we could change Medicare policy tomorrow if somebody has the will and is willing to make a lot of people mad, <laughs> the hospitals for one. Um, make a comment about NIH research um, because this is opinion now, but I, I think oh, here I can. <coughs> we'll share. Yeah, I think uh, first of all, the NIH does um, a large amount of comparative effectiveness research. It's not restricted to you know um, efficacy studies. It does have a, a rich menu of comparative effectiveness. As a matter of fact. It surprises people to know that a lot of health services research is being done at the NIH. I was asked to give a talk um, at a meeting that was sponsored by the Institute of Medicine, and we were asked to present the budget of health services research at the NIH. And it turns out that although we, you know about 3% year after year 
is spent on health services research, that 3% is larger than the entire budget of ARC. Um, and so even if, you know, we have relatively small components of research, we're uh, a sort of a, a powerhouse in almost all areas um, of uh, not only basic but clinical research. So that, that's one issue. The other is, it's my opinion now, uh, oh, and, and there is a strong movement afoot within the NIH to gain the recognition for the comparative effectiveness research it does, and to be sure that we have uh, an important role um, in, in comparative effectiveness research as it goes forward. Um, it's now my opinion is that comparative effectiveness research requires a very broad um, menu of tools. Um, and that spans health services researchers, epidemiologists, people who deal with databases all the time, clinical trialists, because sometimes the signal that you're looking for is washed away by noise in most study designs except for clinical trials, um, uh, randomized clinical trials. And it needs statisticians, applied statisticians, and theoretical statisticians, because we have to get smart about how to develop the most efficient study designs and settings. Um, and all the, it's hard for me personally to think of any single agency that has the depth in all of those um, areas that the NIH uh, does. So I think we do um, play a role and should play a, a, an even bigger role. So I'm, I'm glad you said that because my question was not rhetorical. See, the NIH has a $30 billion give or take budget annually, yeah. but most of that money is already committed. Yes. And so we have this unique opportunity of spending $10 million Right. In a short period of time to do something different. Uh, and I cannot think of a higher priority than what we just heard. Yes. So there is, as I say, movement afoot. Dr. Zahuni, who obviously left uh, the NIH, said in one of his last meetings, um, we, of course, need to play a major role in the dialogue of comparative effectiveness research because if we are not at the table, we're going to wind up on the menu. And um, I think that he made an important statement about the, the role that uh, the NIH will have. In addition, we are going to get money. You know, there's $1.1 billion going into uh, comparative effectiveness research, $700 million going to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, with $400 million going directly to the NIH. So at least there's some recognition on the part of uh, appropriators as well. Let me make one comment uh, the, about what you said. It was a very good question. Do these same, com same concepts apply to the use of medication? They certainly do to screening tests. And you can tell, whenever a screening test drives incidents, you can make the, the assumption that um, the huge variations in incidents are because of differential use of screening tests, like PSA. There are huge variations in prostate cancer incidence and rates of radical prostatectomy from one part of the country to another. And you can be confident that's because of screening tests, not just the, the, pr the surgical procedures. And then finally, medications, is, as Shannon, I think, was getting at, much, much harder to, uh, to ask the question. And the reason is um, a surgical procedure is almost always done for a single problem. You know, a um, coronary artery bypass is for a particular category of problems, knee replacement, hip replacement, and so forth, back surgery. Um, on the other hand, medications have multiple, multiple uses. And since Medicare is one of the primary databases, we have to remember that Medicare, at its best, is nothing more right now than an administrative database, you know, for billing purposes. Um, and so if there are multiple uses for the same medication and also a physician can use his or her clinical judgment for almost any indication as long as there is a paper to justify it in the medical literature, um, you know, non-indicated uses or non-listed uses, then you can't get out of the, the Medicare database doesn't allow you to figure out when one medicine is used for one, um, one indication. But having said that, um, pharmaceutical companies are very well aware that there is tremendous heterogeneity in medication use, at least at the individual physician level, and um, they have 
pretty good databases of which physician in which hospital is selling which drug on their behalf, and they can uh, target them. And, and so there is heterogeneity. I don't know if it's at the county um, or state level, but clearly um, it, it, the same phenomenon goes on at, at least the individual level and the hospital formulary level. Thanks, Barry. I'm. I'm. Uh, I'll be very interested to see how the 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 NIH decides to use that that money in terms of comparative effectiveness. And I and I'm very pleased to hear that the the health services is as high as it is. But I'd love to see it to be higher. I, I had one question, but you just made me think of another question. Um, from a research standpoint, um, I do believe uh, pharmaceutical companies can buy information about what uh, different MDs prescribe that that information. Wh what they prescribe is something that pharmaceutical companies can buy. And the question is, should, from a research perspective, I mean, obviously, if pharmaceuticals have this information, they can use it to their own, um, you know, rather nefarious purposes if they want. But it's information that could be useful for other purposes. Uh, would it be? Would you recommend that Congress were to make it illegal to track what medications physicians are using, or is that actually good to know? Uh, if some physicians are overprescribing certain medications. Is that good information to collect or not? That's one question that I just thought of. But the other question, um, uh, as uh, Dr. Kington told uh, Congress, the uh, House Appropriations Committee just yesterday, uh, our NIH, our 10.4 and the po uh, billion dollar allocation and 0.4 of it for its comparative effectiveness could in fact be used for cost effectiveness research. Um, I was wondering, the connection between, you showed a slide a lot earlier um, near the beginning of your talk that showed uh, how knee replacement could cost twice as much in one place versus another. Um, and there was that cost is what the article was talking about. But you actually talked about util utilization. I was wondering if you can draw a distinct connection between cost and utilization. Does, does utilization drive cost um, through some sort of uh, Medicare uh, algorithm, or is it possibly that the reimbursement, the cost that doctors can get, uh, drives utilization? That's a very complex question. Um, and let me, let me say something about the first question first. Um, uh, f pharmaceutical companies purchase the ability to track individual physician um, uh, um, prescribing habits through something called IMS, which is a database collector. And what they do, what they do is they buy the physician list from the AMA, and they get the individual physician's name and the individual individual physician's identifying number from the AMA. And then what IMS does is it gets information from pharmacies, which lists um, prescriptions filled, and it has the physician identifier on it. And then they would they merge those two lists, and then they sell that information to the pharmaceutical industry, which can can tell down to the pill within a few days how effective their, um, their detailing has been. And they've been using this for a long time to be, able to, um, to be able to target physicians to try to increase their market share of, of um, increase that physician's prescribing of their particular drug. And it would be interesting to get those data, although I'm not sure that we want it at the individual physician level as much as we want it at sort of the, the hospital level or the regional level. Um, whether or not Congress should say, should forbid the sale of this information, I'm not really sure. I, I, I tend to think it tends to makes me it makes me squeamish to, to to think about Congress saying you can't get information because it also would deny it would probably deny researchers the information as well. Yes. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. So the cost thing, I didn't show any cost data. I was all utilization. It was all generally per capita or per thousand utilization. Um, now, there are some variations across the country in how much Medicare pays per unit of service, but it doesn't vary that much. And so it doesn't vary enough to account for the huge variation in, um, in the delivery of the services. The article, you showed an article that said, why is the replacement twice expensive in somewhere in like Did I? No, oh, I did. Well, what do you know? Oh, no, no, no. What that was was need a knee replaced, check your zip code, which is 
you're a lot more, oh, this may be a price one. You're right. Oh, that could be a price one. Oh, that's the wrong story. <laughs> right. Well, that, yeah, that one was spending per capita. Um, but there are, there are variations in how much, how much Medicare pays and how much other payers pay as well in different parts of the country. And I think there was one, right? Did you have a question? Oh, you had a question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to mention, um, apropos of your question about meds and the discussion about medications, that the National Center for Health Statistics surveys physicians in offices, uh, emergency departments, outpatient clinics, various kinds of long-term care facilities, and collects medications use in all of those. So. It, we physically go into those different provider settings and collect information at the level of the organization and then s take a random sample of visits or residents, whatever is appropriate to the different place, and we go into the medical records and abstract information f about clinical management of that care, including um, up to eight medications. and. So those data, strung wow. all together, have information at the level of the facility. If it's, if it's a physician, uh, it's at the level of the clinician, characteristics of the patient, and the clinical management of the patient's care. And uh, there are public use files on the website that you can download. And if you want to get nitty-gritty details that are otherwise confidential, uh, you can uh, can I get help on that? Sure. Yeah, we love, I mean, that's our, that's what we Can do. It, how do I contact you? I'll give you my, I'll give you my card. That would be great. Thank you. But it's part of the Centers for Disease Control, so right. the website yes. is www.cdc.gov um, slash NCHS. I go there regularly, and then I almost always call, because I can't, I can't find my way around that well, so. It's not a great website. No, no, it's not the website. It's, I think it's me. <laughs> no, I can't find things I know are there. Oh, okay. Probably started another book <laughs> with that comment. Um, are there any other questions, Nancy? I was just in terms of the NIH and its organization and structure by institutes which, which focus on Oh, thank you. Our ICs focus on particular disorders and. Uh, Generally, our reference groups are the specialty societies for that particular institute. And um, so most of the focus in terms of research is specialty-based, and yet there is this uh, vast number of primary care physicians out there. Uh, is there um, some research gap, do you think, that w might need to be filled to better access those on the front lines of primary care? You mean to, to, to help them get the information that they need? I mean, or we produce a great deal of important information um, on disorders that they see all the time, but it, it would seem that uh, our, our direct involvement with them as a group um, is uh, one step away. And, and Barry, too, you might want to comment on that as yeah, well. Yeah, there's no National Institute of Primary Care. It's all, it's all well, disease focused. If you focused. had one, what would it do? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Barry, do you want to comment? I, I, I don't have any um, really good comment to that. Um, I think that there are, you know, primary care advocacy groups and generalists that uh, look to the NIH for their funding and therefore as, an, uh, as a, a center for research and an intellectual force, but um, your point is well taken. I just had one other question, too, which has to do with the attention recently that um, the field of uh, imaging and radiology mm -hmm. has received from Congress, yeah. particularly about escalating costs, and uh, wondered if you had some thoughts about that as well that you might leave with us. Yeah. I write about this in my book because I find it really quite extraordinary to look at the rates. Um, the the rate of CT, if we keep going, in a year, in within three or four years, we're going to be doing 300 million 
No, 100 million CT scans a year. I mean, that's a lot of CT scans. <laughs> and since I'm not getting any of them, somebody else is getting mine. <laughs> and so some people are getting one heck of a lot of scans. And the real question is, are they really improving our ability to diagnose? And it's not clear. I mean, in some cases, CT has absolutely clearly made a difference in outcomes. But this huge number of them that just sort of seem to be done as a matter of course in hospitals may not be improving outcomes. And the, the, the thing that's driving the rate up the most is, um, is uh, provider-referred CTs or, or, or provider-owned CT uh, uh, imaging centers. So the, the rate of, of CTs that's going up in, as in, in these centers is much higher than it is in, in the rest of the system. And maybe I can make a comment, and then we're going to have to end. Um, so my comment to that is um, there is a serious problem. And part of it is the training of physicians. Um, and if you sit in on FDA discussions or discussions of professional groups, you'll see a different mindset so that um, there is a, many physicians will feel that um, the definition of effectiveness or efficacy of, a, of a, an imaging test is simply that it shows you something that you would not have been aware of otherwise. And these debates go on when devices are being discussed. And that is, is that sufficient to warrant approval of the drug, of the uh, device, that it simply makes you aware of things that you wouldn't have been aware of, based mainly on sensitivity. Um, but the other side of the equation, which public health physicians tend to um, look at and want information about, is does it change outcomes? Not does it simply show things you wouldn't have known about. Um, and there, you, it gets complex, but it takes a lot longer to do the studies, and it's a lot larger studies, and they're more complicated. And therefore, you can see why physicians invested in the actual, um, uh, invested in the actual diagnostic test or device um, are concerned about waiting for the outcomes of very, very large studies. But it, it's, it's a dramatically different uh, mindset. And, and uh, you have to question, is it is sensitivity for it? There, there's, some things are getting on the market because CMS has said, well, they aren't going to demand outcome studies. Um, they aren't going to simply um, accept any diagnostic imaging tool um, that shows more things than you would have ordinarily been aware of. But they will accept evidence that physicians um, treat differently based on them, make medical, different medical decisions based on them. I, I personally think that that is a serious flaw in study design because you're asking the physician who ordered the test whether or not they respond to the test. And it's almost circular. And if, you, if that's all you require for um, payment, then uh, it, it's, it's a rather low bar, if you ask me. Um, so with that, we've come to the end of the hour and a half, and it moved very, very rapidly, um, uh, I can assure you, for me and I bet you everyone in this room, because uh, it was so entertaining and so good. Um, if someone comes up to ask you uh, I'm ask questions, Shannon will be here for a little bit. And I also want to thank very much the people in my office who uh, organized this and made this possible. Um, Kelly Marcial and Lisa Ramjin are right over there standing and sitting uh, respectively and um, they conceived of this idea they have um, put all of the work into the um, two sessions that we have had Founded me to get my my abstract in on time <laughs> yes and um, this wouldn't even be a uh, there, w there would be no um, mind the gap if it hadn't been for those two and I want to thank them at this point Thanks. And Shannon, thank you.